overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pause and ask for his help as we consider it in the preaching of it this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we now turn our attention to the life-giving word, a word that was given to us and you were pleased to grant that we might have it in our own language, that we might know the mind of the God of, he- of heaven who wrote it. And so we pray that we would sit at your feet, the feet of the Lord Jesus this morning. You would hear from him as your word is read and proclaimed. Give us your spirit, open our ears and our eyes, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. It was in 1765 that John Fawcett was called to pastor a very small congregation at Waynesgate, England. He labored there diligently for seven years, but his salary was so meager that he and his wife could scarcely obtain the necessities of life. Though the people were poor, they compensated for this lack by their faithfulness and warm fellowship. Then, Dr. Fawcett received a call from a much larger church in London And after lengthy consideration, decided to accept the invitation. As his few possessions were being placed in a wagon for moving, many of his parishioners came to say goodbye. Once again, they pleaded with him to reconsider. Touched by this great outpouring of love, he and his wife began to weep. Finally, Mrs. Fawcett exclaimed, Oh, John... I just can't bear this. They need us so badly here. God has spoken to my heart too, he said. Tell them to unload the wagon. We cannot break these wonderful ties of fellowship. This experience inspired Fawcett to write a hymn. You know the hymn. We're going to sing that hymn. At the conclusion of our service this morning, that hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds Our Hearts in Christian Love, the Fellowship of Kindred Mind is like to that above. What is it that unites us together in this church? Is it our looks? Our financial status, our common interests in the things of this world, our favorite sports team, hobbies, or other recreations. Those things are good. There's nothing wrong with any of them. But what truly unites you and me, what is it that truly unites you and me? Simply put, it is our fellowship in the gospel of Christ. It isn't our alignment with a particular denomination. It isn't even in that we are Presbyterian. Yes, I said it. It is that we have been bought with the blood of Christ. We have fellowship with Him and therefore fellowship with others who have experienced the same thing, this tie that binds each of us together, all rooted in the grace and providence of God is the hope of Christ and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this morning, is that how you see one another in this room? Every one of you are different. I can attest to that, and I'm sure you can too. And I'm the most different of them all. But what is it that unites us? What is it that that tie that binds our hearts together? What is it that is so strong 
and inseparable and unbreakable. It is, of course, isn't it? Is that you and I, each of us in this room, have been bought with the blood of our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, that is how you must see one another. Aside from all the idiosyncrasies and anomalies and weirdnesses that each of you possess, and you all have them, you must see each other this way. And as such, then, therefore, you must give thanks. You must give thanks to the God of heaven for that simple yet profound truth. Imagine what it would look like for a church to be so consumed with this singular thing that we would walk up to one another on any given Lord's Day or whenever it is we are together and we would just simply say to one another, I'm so thankful the Lord Jesus Christ saved you and put you here. Imagine the burst of encouragement and help and hope that might come in ways that you might not even know about as we seek to remember the simple yet profound truth. This is why Paul's thankful. This is what moves him in this prayer of thanksgiving. You might think it's just commonplace. This is what Paul does. This is what he usually does. He writes a letter and he always starts with this some kind of prayer of thanksgiving and he's just whipping out some words to get it done so he can move on to the real meat and potatoes of the whole thing. Nope. He is moved this way and especially moved this way about this church at Philippi. Not a perfect church. There has never been one. But a church that he loves and a church that he has been moved by because of their, well, as he says, their koinonia. That's the word in the ESV. It's translated partnership. It's a terrible translation in my opinion. It just loses all the force of what Paul is saying here. The fellowship that they have because of the gospel, in the gospel, with one another, all of it he is moved and he is thankful. He is thankful for them. And so this morning, I want to show you the affection of the apostle expressed in his prayer of thanksgiving for their partnership with him for the sake of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to show you the affection of the apostle expressed in his prayer of thanksgiving for their partnership with him for the sake of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Two points as we consider just verses 3 through 5 in this opening chapter. We'll first consider the apostles' affection. We'll see that by and large in verses 3 and 4. And then the apostles' prayer will draw that from at least the beginning of the prayer from verse 5. The apostles' affection and the apostles' prayer as we deal with just verses 3 through 5 of this chapter. First, the apostle's affection. You notice, as he writes, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. There is a resolve that lies in the heart of this apostle. A determination, if you will, a conscious effort to pray for the church at Philippi, to pray for this church. It's not always easy to remember to do that. Paul was a busy man. As he was sailing around, going from church to church, planting churches, evangelizing others, as he was engaged in not one missionary journey, not two missionary journeys, but three missionary journeys, he was a very busy man. And it's certainly not a natural act for sinful people to do and to remember to do. But as we have already learned in verse 1 of the chapter, he is a servant of the Lord. 
And one of the things a servant of the Lord does and must do is to pray, and to pray for the needs and of the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ, to labor in the work of prayer for the good of the Philippian church. This is not passe. You might think, well, what's the big deal? I think what the big deal is, is that we have lost sight of the value of prayer. We have lost sight of its power. We have lost sight of what it means and because we're so familiar with it, at least in one way, shape, or form. And as I already mentioned, I've already stated, Paul, Paul doesn't just do this is to get it out of the way so he can look like some pious pastor and then move on to something of substance that he'll begin to deal with in verse 12. No, this prayer, it's born out of a love for these people. It's an important thing. Frankly, it's the most important thing he could be doing for this church. It's the most important thing you can do for your brothers and sisters here. To pray, to pray prayers of petition and supplication, to pray prayers of thanksgiving, even as Paul is doing here. Does that characterize you? Do you you pray with fervency and with joy for the saints here in this church? For their needs, are you thankful to God for them? When you pray, what is it that you pray? This was not uncommon for Paul to do for the churches, and there's probably a lesson in that all by itself. What he is concerned about praying may surprise you. His prayers, whether of petition or thanksgiving, are centered on the spiritual well-being of the church. It isn't that Paul doesn't care about the sick at Philippi. I'm sure they had them. I'm sure there was Aunt Susie's with broken toes. And there were myriads of problems that affect the body. And it isn't that Paul didn't care about those things. It isn't that he doesn't care about those temporal needs. But he is, more to the point, concerned with the spiritual well-being of the people. That is his focus. If you go and you just do a cursory examination of all the prayers of the Apostle Paul, you're going to find that to be true. Again, it isn't that he didn't care about your cold or headache or hip replacement. It is that he cares about the spiritual well-being as well. One commentator reflecting on this very point, he says, quote, In his prayers, Paul thanked God for the evidence of spiritual blessing among Christians. Although Paul... Paul was sensitive to the problems in his churches. He was even more sensitive to the mercies of God. He knew people's hearts. He knew there is no, no, good, that good, man, uh, no good man that can satisfy God. He knew that Christians live a great deal of their lives in the flesh instead of in the spirit. He knew that we all for, uh, fall short of what God would like us to be. But Paul was also acquainted with God's grace, and he gloried in it. He knew that God has provided wonderfully for his children, for their salvation, and for their constant and continuing growth in the Christian life. He is concerned for their well-being spiritually. And so he prays. But how does he pray? What does he say? I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer so that I can get it over with and move on to something more important. That's what it says. No, it's not what it says. It says, making my prayer with joy. (laughs) He loves it. 
He is joyful to pray for the needs of the saints at Philippi. He's joyful to pray for the needs of the saints wherever they may be, whether in Galatia, in that you know, terrible church of First Corinthians, at, at Corinth, or even as Thessalonica, or need to pray for the needs of the saints in the lives of Timothy or Titus or Philemon. He's joyful. There's, a, there's an attitude that runs through his prayers as he approaches the God of heaven for the needs and the issues facing the church. It was one of joy. It wasn't, it wasn't something he did merely because the church popped up on his prayer list for that day. Now look, we all do that. Well, it's Tuesday, so I'm praying for the Dickinson's, the, I'm trying to remember my prayer list. Do I pray with joy? Or it's just because their name popped up. Well, God is great, God is good, bless the Dickinson's, let's go home. But I prayed for them. Do I pray with joy? And why is it you should and be able to pray with joy for other people in this congregation? Because he was conscious of the grace of God in their lives. Just like you should be conscious of the grace of God in the lives of other people in this room, though you're different. The same grace that saved you is over here on this side of the room, and it's over there on that side of the room, and it's everywhere in this room. The same grace of God that saved her saved him. And you can be thankful, and you can pray with joy for them. Because they're part of your family. They've been united to you by this grace. And as we look around the room, it should move us to pray for one another because just like you, they too have experienced that same grace. It should move you to be thankful for the grace of God in their lives that rescued them as it rescued you. It is, of course, what unites us together and gives us the same purpose and desire, though we look different. Though we act different sometimes, and though we have the wrong favorite baseball team, notice I didn't say which one was right. Whatever it may be, we should be able to play with joy. We should be able to play. I'm not talking about being giddy. I'm not talking about happiness, necessarily. I'm talking about joy. An abiding quality that just undergirds everything that's going on and everything that is happening. He does so, as I put it here in my outline, his desire, but that's probably not the best way of outlining it. I couldn't really come up with a better word, frankly, but whatever the case may be, he, he writes that he prays for them with thanksgiving. That's how he begins. I thank my God, he says. What is it that he is thankful for in the lives of the believers at Philippi? What is it that I should be thankful for in your life? What is it that you should be thankful for about others here in this room at this church? Well, put simply, you are to be thankful for the grace of God at work in others here. That's why he's thankful. He is thankful in every remembrance of them. Why? Because he knows that they have experienced, verse 2, the grace that has come to them, the grace of Christ that has come to them. He calls them saints. He says they're Christians. They belong to the same family, and he's thankful for these things. And he is thankful as he sees and watches this young church, maybe 10 years of age, mature and grow. United under that main thing, that umbrella of the gospel of Christ. And so he's praying this prayer of thanks because of the work of God in them. No, they're not where he wants them to be. You're not where you should be. None of them at Philippi have arrived. I haven't arrived, and you haven't arrived. 
but we see and we witness and we take note, just like Paul, that God is working. For some of you, it's very slow. For others, it's very obvious and faster. That's God's doing. It's not your doing, it's not my doing. Everybody grows up different ways at different speeds. You know, when I was growing up, I was a runt. I was called shorty, and and I'm still kind of short, but I was always the shortest guy around. And then, you know, as you know, one day I wake up and I'm suddenly 17 inches taller than I was the day before. Okay, that's an exaggeration, but you get the point. We're all growing at different speeds, but we're thankful for the grace of God that is enabling them to grow in the first place. And when Paul thinks about this young church, it moves him to this joyful thankfulness. Maybe he's reflecting as he prays on the founding of the church. You remember that from last week. Perhaps he thinks about good reports he hears from them and about them. Whatever it is, the root of his prayer is thanksgiving for the grace they have experienced at the hands of a loving, good, and kind God. At the very least, our prayers for one another should at least capture that. Our prayers for one another as members of the same family should at least capture the idea that says, I am thankful to God that the grace of God is working and has rescued them and has saved them, and they are like me. They are my brother. They are my sister. And we have been united by a bond that is richer than any other thing on this earth. We should be able to pray that. Paul models it. He does it. Let me encourage you to fill and focus your prayer life more in this area. You know, I suspect that if we were more conscious of prayers of thanksgiving for one another, we would be less prone to grumble about other people and complain about what they do and do not do. It's funny how that works. It's not really that funny. Paul comes back to this later. He will, in fact, come back to this labor. Apparently, there was a certain air of complaining in the church. He tells them to knock it off. Prayers of thanksgiving have a way of removing that tendency. But notice his prayer is not just one of thanksgiving, it's constant. In all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine. To pray with thanksgiving for others requires that you remember them. Herein lies part of the problem. We leave this place out of sight, out of mind. We don't think about our brothers and sisters until the next Sunday, and we forget that they even exist. Okay, maybe that's not you. Well, maybe it is. And we don't pray for them, we're not thankful for them, we're not praying prayers of joy for them, because we don't remember to do it. I often encourage people to make a prayer list, but don't get hung up on that. It's very easy to just go through the motions. Paul remembers this church. He's not even there. He's not even in the same city. He's very far removed from them, as a matter of fact. You remember, he's in prison. But he obviously thinks so fondly of them that they are often on his mind. They are not an afterthought at the end of a long day. As a good pastor, he makes a conscious effort to remember them and pray for them. He doesn't merely thank God for them, but he prays for their spiritual well-being as well. And he's going to do that, and we're going to deal with that when the next few Sundays ahead. Though he doesn't say it here, he will say it later. You want to remember to pray for one another in this church? I've already said this, and well, make a list, do something. 
that helps you remember that you have brothers and sisters, blood bought, in a stronger union with them. And I'm sorry, you're not going to like that. Well, maybe you will. Some of you are going to agree readily, and some of you are going to struggle with this. But I'm sorry, but the relationship we have is blood bought. Brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ is stronger than your marriage. It's stronger than your relationship with your children and your parents. Why do I say that? Because it's eternal. That's why. And it is. What is it that can separate you from one another? Is there anything? Death will separate me from my wife in that bond of matrimony. No longer married. That's kind of weird to think about, too. You ever thought about that, you married people? Strange. I see my wife in heaven, and we're not married. It's weird. It can be weird. Of course, that's on this side of heaven. I probably won't care then. And my wife will be glad. <laughs> same with your children and same all that. That relate, those are done. It's a good gift God gives us in this world, but they all end. But not that bond, that bond of union between one another, bought by the blood of Christ. It should move you to remember each other and to do so with joy. Look what he's knit together, a bunch of different people. All these ways of living and grammar issues, strange and everything else. So endeavor to remember. Families and family worship. There's no reason you can't remember to pray for a family that night. Get them. Get the directory. Since we're not that big a church. Get the directory. Go through it. Father, I am thankful. I am thankful that you saved them. I am thankful that you united me to them for all eternity. That I can learn from them as they learn from me, and we can iron sharpens iron, and, and all of the great blessings that come from that unique fellowship that is ours. It's not rocket science. But you have to remember to do it. You have to determine it. Fathers, don't let today go by without determining to lead your family that way. Paul remembers the gift of the church. He loved them enough to pray for them. Don't you tell me you love me and then not pray for me. Don't say it. And really, don't say you love each other if you're not praying for each other. Because as I've already for each other is pray for them. But we need to believe that to lead the church. Well, what did we pray? Well, we know it's a prayer of thanksgiving. We know the object of this prayer. Verse 5. Notice, or sorry, verse 3. I thank my God. Look, prayer is not well wishing. I get so sick of the good thoughts for you in the world. It won't do a thing. Prayer is bringing your needs before the God of heaven. He's not merely talking to himself. He is not merely offering good thoughts or warm wishes. He is praying to the one true God of heaven and earth. His focus is on him. It is to him that he seeks to honor and glorify for the reasons of his thankfulness for these Philippian believers. Thus, thanksgiving, as always, thanksgiving requires an object, and the object is not the Philippians. The object of his prayer is the God of heaven. He knows that the root and fruit of the Philippian believers depends on the grace of God. And as you give thanks for the great salvation, the question, of course, comes, do you give thanks for it to him? 
I don't walk up to you and say, I'm thankful that you're smart enough to be a Christian. That would like completely defy, well, the Bible. I don't walk up to you and say, I'm so thankful that you were born in the United States and you had the presence of mind to live in Evansville where you heard the gospel and became a Christian. Nope. Those are all nice things, but that's not how it happened. No, no, my object of my thanksgiving and prayer for you, as it always should be, is the God of heaven. You wouldn't dare turn to the person sitting next to you in the pew this morning and thank them for their intelligence because they're Christians. No, you give thanks to the object and source of their salvation. You praise God for it. Our shorter catechism tells us that true prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and, well, here it is, thankful acknowledgement of His mercies. That's why you're thankful. That is the object to whom you offer this prayer of thanksgiving, not to people, but to the God of heaven who saved this church at Philippi, who saved this church at Providence, who saved you and me sitting in this room or standing in this case. His reason, what is it that makes Paul so very thankful to God for these believers? What should make me very thankful for you as members of Providence, what should make you very thankful to God for one another in this room? What Paul tells us. It's right here. You just have to read. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He's covering a 10-year period in this prayer. He gives the reason. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The term Paul uses here is significant. Again, I've already said this. I'm not crazy about the way the ESV translates this word. The word here is that word. We all know what it is. We've heard it said so many times it almost loses meaning. It's koinonia. It's fellowship. It's a unique word. Paul uses it three more times. Uh, three times in this letter, it's really a Christian word. One commentator, he puts it this way as he talks about the significance of the term that Paul employs here when he says the word fellowship has been so watered down in contemporary speech that it conveys only a faint suggestion of what it meant in earlier times. When we speak of fellowship today, we generally mean no more than comradeship. That's how it's used often. The sharing of good times. But fellowship originally meant more than sharing of something like the fellowship of bank robbers dividing their loot. It meant the sharing in something. In is italicized here in the quote. It meant to share in something, participating in something greater than the people involved and more lasting than the activity of any given moment. When the Bible uses the word, it means being caught up into a communion created by God. So it's not a human thing. It's not a human invention. It's not something that we threw together here at Providence on this road. We just tossed it together because of our intelligence or our wisdom or our understanding or any other creative thing. This fellowship that we have was put together by God. This partnership that we have with one another in the hope of the gospel, has been put together by God himself. The same commentator goes on, he says, the Philippians may have had things in common, but Paul is not speaking of these things. 
He is thankful for the share in the gospel. They had been taken up into a divine fellowship. They were united, not upon a social level, but by their commitment to the truths of the gospel. This is the main thing. This is what they have pledged their lives to do as as a community of believers for and with one another. They have labored to advance the gospel. And they've been doing it from the first day it ever entered Europe ten years later. So no wonder Paul's thankful for them. Does that describe us today? We live in a society, in a culture, in our 21st century in which churches, they divide fellowship over tertiary reasons, secondary reasons, and they lose sight of the reality that in this church, as far as I know, the gospel is preached. How many times have you witnessed in your lives people breaking fellowship in churches all across this world over secondary issues? The gospel is lost. The church of Philippi, no, no. They're in fellowship. They are family. They are united together. The ups and downs of it all may come, but they are together. And they are going to work together with all of their weirdnesses and idiosyncrasies and strange things and activity for the gospel. That's their goal. May it always be ours. Some considerations about this koinonia. These are important, and you need to get these down. If you're a note taker, you need to write them down. First, this koinonia, this fellowship that you and I enjoy, this, this fellowship is divinely organized. It is not a human invention. The gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has saved you, given you strength for today and hope for tomorrow, did not originate with a mere man, but the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is of no human agency. You are not in fellowship with one another here at Providence because you, because you share similar social standings, economic blessings, or the lack of such. Your employment or the way you look. You are in fellowship here. Because God saved you. God saved you. Just like he saved these people in the first century. He saved you. And he poured out his grace on you. This fellowship is unique. For it is of divine organization. Second... This fellowship is providentially organized. How do I, why do I say that? Because I was thinking through what it, you know, the implications of being in fellowship and what it all means. What might be running through Paul's head or not. What do I mean that it was providentially organized? What caused me to even write that down? You remember, where did Paul want to go? I want to go to Asia. I'm going to go there. You remember what happened, right? The Lord said, no, no. I got work for you to do here. I'm going to send you to Philippi where a church is going to be planted and souls are going to be saved and the glory of God's kingdom is going to be seen in a city and it's going to prosper and it's going to grow and 10 years from now you're going to be in so, you're going to have such affection for this place you won't even believe it. It was providentially organized. And from this prevention of going to Asia, a body of believers came together, all very different. And the same is true here. I know you think you came to Providence because 
Well, I don't know why you came. One reason or another. I know you think that it was because of your wisdom. I know you think it was because of your ingenuity, because you examined the issues and you made a sound choice. You may have done all of those things. But the fact is that you are in fellowship with one another in this place because it was divinely organized and providentially brought to pass by the sovereign Lord. It wasn't due to my preaching or lack of it. It wasn't due to the teaching or lack of it. It wasn't due to the building or lack of it. When I came here, there was no building. I mean, well, there's a building, but we were running. It wasn't for any of those reasons. This fellowship that you enjoy today came to be because of God's own divine providence and work. And you are here, united with one another, due to that providence. It wasn't an accident. It isn't that God could care less about where you unite yourself. He wanted you here. He wanted you here with all of its weaknesses and strength. Philippi had them. We've got them. That you might partner with others here for the sake of the gospel. Third, not only is this fellowship divinely organized and providentially organized, it it has one goal, really one goal. Churches all over the place, they have mission statements, you know, and they're got this, that, and the other thing, they're going to do a bullet list. Great, that's nice. I got one. One. One goal. The same goal that the church of Philippi had, that's our goal, to advance the gospel in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. The great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ, go and make disciples of every nation, go and make disciples of every street that surrounds the church. That's the goal. And you've been united together. You've been brought into fellowship, each one of you, with different gifts. i got to tell you, I can't play the piano. You don't want me to do that. It won't sound very good. I mean, I could beat on the keys if you'd like. Won't make much sense. The Lord brought a gift that we can hear and we have playing the piano. Prior to that and still at times, we have another who plays guitar. Again, I can't do that. I don't have any musical skill in my body whatsoever. But those are my gifts. The Lord gave me different gifts. He gave you different gifts, and he has united this weird bunch of people together in fellowship that we might work together as one body for what purpose? To advance the gospel, just like the church at Philippi. This is why Paul is thankful, because that's what they're doing. They're all strange. They're all weird, but they're doing the work of the gospel, and that's what we should be doing. And that's their point, and that's their purpose Some of you come, you have gifts to give that seem seem mundane, like cleaning the church. You might think, what's the big deal? Nobody cares anyway. Well, I care. I can tell you that. I'm here every day of the week. I care. But so do others. And by the way, maybe you ought to be thanking each other for doing that mundane work. Just as an exhortation. But it's all necessary if we're going to work together that we might have a welcoming place, especially the bathrooms, for visitors. That we might advance the gospel. That is always the end game. Always the end game. It's not that we just have great preaching and, and a pretty room. No, that Christ would be exalted. That's the goal. And that is what unites us. It's the Christ, the Savior who saved us, and it is his mission that unites us and drives us forward. That is why he is so thankful. He is thankful for the partnership that they have with him in the advancement of the gospel of Christ. Nine times in this letter, he uses that term gospel more than any other letter he ever wrote, and it's one of the shortest. You don't think this is an important subject for him? And he doesn't see how important it is for them and why he is so thankful for them. 
Now, there are other aspects of this partnership. This koinonia, this koinonia that is divinely organized, Providence Presbyterian Church landed on the map because God wanted it here. It is divinely, uh, providentially organized. That is to say, you're here because God wanted you here. And it has one goal, but it also has requirements. Koinonia has to be worked on. What are those requirements? What is Paul thinking here when he says your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now? Well, in the immediate context, he's talking about money. Yep. Subject no pastor likes to talk about, but you know, this is the next text in the series. And when he says he is thankful for their partnership in the gospel, he is talking about many things, but he is specifically, contextually talking about money. Finances. Giving. No, you're making that up because you make your living by the church. I am not making it up. Philippians 4 Beginning with verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound and in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. Abundance and need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Convinced? This isn't just one time love gift that the Philippian church offers to advance the gospel. It was frequent and often. How's your giving? I don't enjoy preaching on this subject. You know that, but it's here. I can't ignore it. How's your giving to the church? Are you concerned with the advance of the gospel as the church get the leftovers out of your paycheck every week? To live in koinonia, to live in fellowship and partner with the gospel means you support the work of the ministry. I'm not going to give you a percentage. You wrestle with that. But to much is given, much is required. And what is it you've been given? Brothers and sisters, you've been given the grace of God that has rescued you from hell and doom. Clearly, this is what Paul's saying. He is thinking this. There is no question about this. But it's not just this. Later, he uses that same word, koinonia, in, verse, in chapter 2 and verse 1, when he encourages the people to be of the same mind. Well, that's tough, isn't it? He didn't say be uniformed, look like each other. You know, next week I want you to all walk in the church and look just like me. No, don't do that. No, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about the unity of the faith. He's not arguing for uniformity. He isn't thankful for the church because they all look the same, talk the same, give the same. He's talking about having the mind of Christ, considering others more important than themselves. Wouldn't that be refreshing? To see people stop worrying about themselves so much 
and worry about the needs and concerns of other people. I think we can all grow in that area, including me. But he says, hey, koinonia, fellowship, partnering with the gospel, this is what it looks like. That's what it looks like. Third, it also means participating in suffering. Again, he uses the same word in chapter 3 and verse 10. Under the context of suffering, the sufferings of Christ, to, to, to enjoy fellowship with Christ in his sufferings. We don't like talking that way. We're Americans. I want ease and simplicity. It took us four hours to figure out to buy chairs, not pews, because we were worried about people's tushies. We're Americans. No, no, koinonia, suffering, the suffering of Christ. To suffer with and for each other, to bear one another's burdens. This is what it looks like to be in community with one another. To weep with those who weep. There are other things as well. Now you're probably thinking the sermon's never going to end. It's going to end. I'm almost done. Practical applications. If I haven't given you enough already. Partnering with one another for the sake of the gospel leads to some very practical things. If you partner with something, if you have true Christian fellowship with others, it means you are supporting the work of the church. Now you're thinking, oh, he just, you just said that. No, I'm, I'm talking about something different. I'm not talking about your money. As a pastor, I honestly don't care if you give a dime. The Lord will take care of me. But I do care about your soul. Supporting the work of the church means you're here. The means of grace. To support the work of the church and the work of the gospel means you're here, that your soul may be fed, that you might learn how to go out into the world and live the terms of the gospel to advance the kingdom of Christ. This is what it means. You're present. I know we're all busy. Look, I'm busy too. I don't know what you think I do all week long. I know you are as well. We're all busy. Lord's Day and Wednesday night, five hours a week, partner with the gospel here, that we might pray and plead for the advance of the gospel at prayer meeting, together as a people, in koinonia with one another. That we might hear the gospel and we might understand it better and understand the word of God better and the worship of God and its preaching on the Lord's Day. The second, you are praying for the work of the church as well. You're modeling what Paul's doing. Do you pray for the work of this church? You pray for his success and its advance and the kingdom to roll right through this neighborhood. You need to pray for it. This is what it looks like. This is what it means to be in fellowship, to be in koinonia with one another. And Paul is so grateful that he has this unique church of all the churches that he says this to. I'd love it if Paul would write that about this church. The hymn mentioned in the introduction in which we are going to sing in just a very few moments, says, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship, the koinonia of kindred minds is like to that above. First, recognize and reflect with great thanks and joy that you have been united to Christ because of His marvelous grace. If that is old news to you, then sit down and think about it again. It's not old news. It's the most important news. Without it, which we couldn't have koinonia. We couldn't be in fellowship. Which is second, remember that your fellowship is rooted in the fellowship you have with Christ. Third, consider how you may express this fellowship through prayer and acts of love to and for one another. 
Fourth, as you seek the fellowship of the saints, remember that you are most like the fellowship experienced between the members of the eternal Godhead. You want to know what their fellowship is like? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit? I know you're going to say, because you're good theologians, it's perfect. Of course it's perfect. It's sweet. They're always looking out for the interests of one another. There's perfect harmony. And we're going to fall short of that, but when we strive for it, we look more and more like that all the time. Fifth, remember what unites you and me is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing more and nothing less. Not your gray hair or lack of it, your clothes, your looks, nothing, the gospel. If that looks like us here, that won't make Paul happy. I mean, it maybe, well, it won't. He's, it won't. It'll make me happy. No, no. Thankful. But it will honor the Lord. That's why he put you here together. That you might live in fellowship with one another. There's nothing more sweet than the fellowship of Christian believers. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and again, we are reminded of the hope of the gospel and what it does and how it unites us together as brothers and sisters in a bond that is so thick it can never be broken. Cause us that we might live this way, that we might live in koinonia with one another, always, always, always looking to advance the hope of Christ to others. Give us this grace, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen.